Hello again. We'll talk about abdominal trauma here. So we'll briefly cover some of the anatomy that's relevant for abdominal trauma, some of the physical exam signs that you'll want to know when you're confronting the abdominal trauma patient, um, just the most important physical exam signs. We'll talk about two of the mechanisms of abdominal trauma, both penetrating and blunt abdominal injury. Important to remember that you can have both mechanisms of injury in the same patient at the same time. These aren't mutually exclusive, but uh, most of the time you'll have one or the other. We'll talk about the indications for exploratory laparotomy, which is your surgical management when you have an abdominal trauma patient. A lot of patients with abdominal trauma will be managed with an exploratory laparotomy. Then we'll talk about some of these, uh, briefly talk about some of the specific organs. So I want to talk about the injury mechanisms first because when you're confronted with a patient on the trauma bay or in the ED, you are confronted with a patient. You don't necessarily know which, uh, which organ is injured. You do know, however, if this is a penetrating injury or a blunt injury. So that's going to dictate your initial workup. Once you get imaging, once you uh, have worked up the patient, then you'll have a better idea of what organ may be damaged, and that can dictate further workup. But I want to first talk about what's most important, and that is when the patient first comes in, what do you do? For trauma purposes, the abdomen is considered anything below the nipple line all the way down as far as the pubic line. And the reason is because you have abdominal viscera that go up past the inferior margin of your costal cartilages. So a lot of people think, okay, my abdomen is uh, perhaps where my uh, abdominal rectus muscles are, uh, or my abdomen is uh, below my costal cartilages. And that may be a fine uh, definition for other purposes, but you have abdominal viscera that go up above your costal cartilages, up above the inferior margin especially including your liver and spleen, which are two of the most common uh, injured organs in abdominal trauma. So for our purposes for trauma, the abdomen is everything below the nipple line, all the way down to the pubic line. This includes your peritoneum, which is your liver and spleen, your stomach, the last one quarter of your duodenum, the small bowel, all the rest of it, so jejunum and ileum, the transverse colon, and the sigmoid colon. The retroperitoneum is the last three quarters of the duodenum, then the pancreas and kidneys, the ureters, the ascending and descending colon, and the major vessels. The pelvis includes the bladder, urethra, the rectum, rectum the iliac arteries and veins, uh, and then the uh, reproductive organs, ovaries, uterus, prostate. So we're not going to talk about pelvis so much here. We're not going to talk about kidneys or ureters. That's a topic for uh, another section, but we will talk about uh, the, everything you see in the peritoneum and then the GI stuff of the retroperitoneum. Some physical exam signs that you will see in abdominal trauma patients or that you may see uh, first off are the seatbelt sign. So that's exactly what it sounds like. This is an abrasion due to wearing a seatbelt. One of the most common ways that you get abdominal trauma is motor vehicle accident. And so if the patient is wearing their, uh, their seatbelt, as they should, uh, if they're involved in a high-energy collision, you're going to see that abrasion on their uh, chest, their abdomen. Um, remember that you have both, uh, most of the times you have the diagonal belt and then you have the lap belt. It's important to ascertain whether the patient was only wearing a lap belt a lot of times that's children are only wearing a lap belt, uh, but you should see both the diagonal and the uh, lap belts. Uh, if you do see this, what you need to consider is a lumbar spinal fracture, which is called a chance fracture, and this can also be a thoracic spinal fracture or a cervical spinal fracture. Chance fracture just means that you have a fracture due to, uh, due to uh, flexion of the spine due to overflexion of the spine. The reason this happens is because of inertia. When you, cr uh, when you cr crush into something, you crash into a, uh, uh, a wall, let's say, you have inertia pushing you forward, but you also have a force that's stopping you. And so the, the mobile part of your body that's not restrained 
is going to continue moving forward uh, and the restrained part is going to stay in place and so the uh, you're going to get anterior flexion uh, because of the inertia. So uh, that's what causes the chance fracture. Uh, and then you should also consider bladder and or bowel perforation in patients with a seatbelt sign. So these three things are things that you should consider when you see the patient with the seatbelt sign. Cullen sign is periumbilical ecchymosis. This points towards hemorrhage in the peritoneum. Gray-Turner sign is a flank ecchymosis. This points to hemorrhage in the retroperitoneum. Care sign is pain in the left shoulder and left neck. And this is associated with injury to the spleen. So just having left shoulder neck pain is not care sign. But if you have a patient with abdominal trauma and they have left shoulder or left neck pain, especially if it's elicited with palpation of the left upper quadrant, you should consider this to be a positive care sign. And this is, uh, this, this is very, very, very much associated with injury to the spleen. The reason being, if you have injury to the spleen, fluid, blood around the spleen, this irritates nerves around the diaphragm, and that's going to refer to your left shoulder and neck. So it's somewhat similar to the pain that you get uh, after you have uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery. So here's the seatbelt sign. You can see the uh, diagonal abrasions here and then the uh, lap belt here. Another one, lap belt down here, diagonal belt here. This is a chance fracture. So here's anterior here and posterior back here. All that happened was you had a portion probably down here that was, uh, that was restrained up here, was mobile, and the spine flexed too far and it caused the breakage of the spinous process. And you can also see breakage in the body as well. So here's another one. So you might not be able to see it very well looking anterior, posteriorly, but if you look laterally, it's much easier to see the fracture. Cullen sign, this is ecchymosis around the umbilicus. And Gray-Turner sign, which is a flank ecchymosis. You probably won't see these ecchymoses uh, Cullen's or Gray Turner sign right away in a patient is something that develops over time. So the two types of injury are penetrating abdominal injury. This is most commonly caused from gunshot wound, stabbing, can also be caused from shrapnel injuries and other uh, less common uh, modes of injury. Uh, but usually it's gunshot wounds and stabbings due to violent problems. Uh, the organ most commonly damaged is the liver, and the reason is because your liver is so big, it covers up so much space in your abdomen, and it's more superficial. So the liver is the most commonly damaged organ in your uh, abdomen when it comes to penetrating injury. With blunt abdominal injury, this is usually because of a car accident. Uh, this can be due to direct blow, crush injury, deceleration injury, the organ most commonly damaged here is the spleen, but you can also easily get damage to your liver as well. So the penetrating abdominal injury is usually due to gunshot wounds and stab wounds. Gunshot wounds, as a rule, uh, always penetrate the peritoneum or retroperitoneum. I mean, it's hard to imagine having a gunshot wound. That's a legitimate gunshot wound that doesn't penetrate if it's if it's to the abdomen that isn't penetrating the peritoneum or retroperitoneum. Most of the time even you'll have an exit wound where it actually leaves the body too. So it goes in one place and leaves in another place. So because of that, gunshot wounds, because they virtually always penetrate the peritoneum or retroperitoneum, they're always going to require surgery, exploratory laparotomy. And that's not to find the bullet or anything. That's to look for uh, viscous injuries and injuries of any uh, organ and to repair that. Uh, so as a rule, gunshot wounds, they always penetrate the peritoneum or retroperitoneum and they're going to re require exploratory laparotomy. That's as a rule for the USMLE uh, and most of the time in real life. I'm sure there are very, very rare exceptions, but we're concerned about the rule, not the exception. As far as stab wounds, that's going to depend on the depth as to whether 
or not we're going to think about exploratory laparotomy. So the severity of stab wounds vary based on the depth as well as the habitus of the patient. So if you have a really, really thin patient or a, a child, a one-inch stab wound or even a half-inch stab wound may be enough to penetrate the peritoneum or retroperitoneum and thus necessitate surgery. However, if you have a morbidly obese patient, a one-inch stab wound probably won't even cross the, uh, the, the fat. So in that case, you may not even need to do surgery. You'll probably just uh, do wound repair, uh, so debridement and stitches. So the severity of stab wounds vary based on the depth. So here we need to take into consideration the, the, the severity. We're not necessarily rushing off to surgery with stab wounds. And a good way to determine how bad it is is to just uh, put on a sterile glove, use your finger, and see if you can palpate any abdominal viscera. If you palpate abdominal viscera, then it's probably uh, a, a, an injury to... Uh, that penetrated the peritoneum. Uh, all right, so initial management. So, of course, we want to make, make sure that the patient has a secure airway and they're breathing properly. The big concern with penetrating abdominal injury is blood loss. You have lots of vessels down there. Uh, so that's really going to be our biggest problem in patients with penetrating abdominal injuries. It's really difficult to get a patient above uh, 100 or 110 systolic as we normally would want to do uh, just because if they are losing blood it's probably going to be rapid and so uh, there is a problem that can come about if you give the patient too much fluids uh, it's called abdominal compartment syndrome and so we want to be we want to give them enough fluids to make sure that they've got a normal systolic pressure and normal being more than 90 uh, but we don't want to overload them with fluids. And so the recommendation is to replace fluids enough to maintain systolic pressure above 90 millimeters of mercury. You don't need to go any higher than that. As long as you're over 90 in a penetrating abdominal injury, you're fine. Don't overload them with fluids. Just enough to stay above 90. Once you've tended to your ABCs, you do a focused physical examination, looking at the abdomen, making sure that they've got a stable pelvis, making sure that there's no long bone injuries. Uh, try to identify where the bleeding is coming from, especially if they came in with shock. Uh, think of all the areas you can bleed. You can bleed from your head, you can bleed from your thorax, you can bleed in your abdomen, you can bleed from your uh, femur, uh, leg, uh, you can bleed from your pelvis. Uh, so, uh, you, you want to rule out uh, as much of those as possible. Uh, stable patients should get, oh, I should also mention, uh, trauma labs should be ordered. So CBC, BMP, you'll probably want to have cultures with the blood too. Uh, you'll want to get a coagulation, uh, typing and matching, and then an abdominal x-ray and a chest x-ray. Uh, any violation of the peritoneum or retroperitoneum is going to require prophylactic antibiotics. So you'll want to cover GI flora. And so uh, what I would use would be uh, cefoxetin in a patient who's non-penicillin allergic. Uh, if they are penicillin allergic, you could use something like um, uh, clindamycin and gentamicin. Those two would cover uh, the GI flora as well. As far as uh, imaging the patient, th that's going to be important as part of the management. However, the, it's the hemodynamic status that is going to dictate how we image the patient. So if the patient is stable, yes, we can send them off for CT. If they're not stable, this is more of an urgent scenario, then you can do fast exam. In reality, you're probably going to do fast exam on everybody. Uh, you'll do fast exam while you're waiting for uh, the, the radiology crew to come take them down to CT. Uh, but in urgent scenarios, fast exam will be your imaging uh, of choice. Uh, and the fast exam is just a set of ultrasound examinations uh, that can easily find bleeding. But CT is your best exam, and that's what you should choose if it's a stable patient. So the ABCs 
focus physical exam, trauma labs and plane films, uh, CT or FAST, your imaging, and then uh, antibiotics and a tetanus booster for penetrating abdominal injury is your initial management. The surgical management is going to be exploratory laparotomy, uh, and that's going to depend on their injury. So if it's a gunshot wound to the abdomen, you're going to do an exploratory laparotomy because it's easy to assume with a gunshot wound that you have penetration of the peritoneum. If it's a stab wound, you can treat them conservatively if there isn't penetration of the peritoneum. Uh, however, if there is penetration or if there are any other indications for laparotomy, uh, then you're sending them off to the OR. So our diagnostic modalities, we kind of talked about this already. Plain films are part of our initial management. These should be ordered on all abdominal trauma patients. The chest x-ray is good uh, if you have uh, an injury to the diaphragm. You can see uh, bowel contents in the, uh, in, in the thorax. Usually it's on the left side, so that's something that can easily tip you off to a diaphragm injury. If you see that, off to the OR. An abdominal x-ray is also useful. Uh, cervical and lumbar spinal films should also be uh, added to that as well, uh, especially if they uh, are suspected for a chance fracture. You should probably add in their thoracic spinal films uh, as well. So you're looking for any kind of problems with the, with the spine. For CT, this is the most commonly, most commonly done and the most accurate diagnostic modality for any kind of abdominal injury. Uh, this exceeds any other kind of, uh, any other kind of uh, imaging that you could do. So if we can send them off for CT, we do. This is only, however, performed if the patient is hemodynamically stable. If they are unstable, you are not going to wait and then have them wheeled down to a CT lab and then have them wheeled back. We don't want them dying while they're being imaged. So this is only performed if the patient is hemodynamically stable. And be careful on the USMLE. If uh, they will certainly give you CT and FAST exam as uh, choices, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, go ahead and choose CT. If not, you need something quicker. Now, if the patient has an absolute indication for exploratory laparotomy, you don't need to do CT because you're going, you're already going to be going in and looking at them surgically anyway. So, for instance, if they have evisceration, you're going to be doing a laparotomy on that patient anyway. So, don't even worry about getting a CT. You're going to send them straight to the OR. The FAST exam, which stands for Focused Abdominal Sonography for Trauma, is uh, a series of four ultrasound readings, three of which are looking for bleeding in the abdomen. So the three places you're looking in the abdomen are uh, the right upper quadrant in between the liver and the kidney. That's called Morrison's pouch. This is one of the most dependent areas in the entire abdomen if the patient is supine. So if you see bleeding there, then uh, you know that there's intra-abdominal bleeding. Uh, so this is looking in between the liver and the kidney in the right upper quadrant. The other place you're going to look is the left upper quadrant, and that's at the spleno-renal recess, so in between the spleen and the kidney. And then another place you're going to look is just above the pubis, and you're looking at the pouch of Douglas, and that's in between the bladder and the rectum. If you see any fluid line, uh, then that's considered bleeding, and the patient is going to be sent off to the OR. Another place uh, that you're going to look with a fast exam that's not abdominal related, but you still look anyway, is the pericardium. And so what you do here is you just orient your, uh, your ultrasound probe uh, right below the xiphoid process. You orient it superiorly and you should get a nice uh, image of the uh, pericardium. And if there's a fluid line, these patients are going to need uh, these patients are going to need surgical management as well, but it's not going to be, uh, these patients won't be getting uh, exploratory laparos uh, laparotomy for their injury. They're going to need, uh, they're going to need decompression of their pericardium. So uh, I just add that because the FAST exam wouldn't be complete without looking at the pericardium. But that's, the per looking at the pericardium obviously does not, uh, does not show abdominal injury.
So those are the four places you look for fast exam. This is ideal for non-stable patients because of its relative efficiency. It's quick. You can find bleeding uh, pretty easily. However, if the patient is stable, you send them out for CT because it's much easier to see the bleeding with CT. Fast exam, because it's an ultrasound, it's operator dependent. Diagnostic peritoneal lavage can be used, but it's widely replaced by the FAST exam because it's less invasive. With blunt abdominal injury, this is most commonly due to motor vehicle accidents, the shearing forces, deceleration injury, crushing injury that happens with, blunt, uh, with motor vehicle accidents. Your initial management is going to be pretty similar, so we're looking at the ABCs. Uh, you want to do a focused physical examination. Here we're going to be very concerned about the possibility of peritoneal signs. Uh, if there are peritoneal signs, this automatically is going to warrant exploratory laparotomy. Remember that with a blunt abdominal injury patient, you're not going to see any knife or bullet wound. And so if there is guarding or rigidity or uh, rebound tenderness, that's peritoneal signs. That's going to send them off to the OR. You shouldn't see that in a patient with blunt abdominal injury unless they've got something really wrong going on in their abdomen. Trauma labs and plain films are ordered as per usual, and just like in uh, penetrating injury, stable patients will go to a CT to assess damage. Unstable patients will get fast. And then the operative management it's going to be exploratory laparotomy as indicated. Not all patients with blunt abdominal injury uh, need exploratory laparotomy. Some do, some don't. What are the indications for exploratory laparotomy? So if the patient has abdominal trauma and they have had hemodynamic instability, they're going to get an exploratory laparotomy. But the first thing you do before you operate on the patient is stabilize them. So when I say abdominal trauma plus hemodynamic instability, I mean that they have had hemodynamic instability. And why does this indicate exploratory laparotomy? If the patient has hemodynamic or has had hemodynamic instability, they have to be bleeding somewhere. And we're concerned with abdominal trauma that they're bleeding somewhere in the abdomen. That would make sense. Unless they've got somewhere else that they're bleeding from that you can see, it's going to be abdominal bleeding until proven otherwise. So hemodyna uh, hemodynamic instability in the setting of abdominal trauma will require exploratory laparotomy once they have been stabilized. If there's peritoneal irritation, that's going to go to the OR. If there's evisceration, as mentioned earlier, that's going to go to the OR. If there's suspected or known diaphragmatic injury, that's going to go to the OR. So part of that chest x-ray can help us determine if there is an injury to the diaphragm. A normal chest x-ray doesn't rule out injury to the diaphragm, uh, but if you do see bowel in the thorax, that's a diaphragmatic injury. So those patients will go off to the OR. Rectal perforation, bleed per stomach. This you can often get by placing an NG tube. If you aspirate blood, you can be pretty confident that this is bleeding from the stomach. If there's free intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal air, you can see this uh, either on abdominal or chest x-ray. Uh, you can also see this on CT. That's going to indicate laparotomy. And if there's a positive diagnostic peritoneal lavage or a positive FAST exam, that's going to indicate exploratory laparotomy. All right, so these are uh, some of the indications. I can't say that these are all. These are the top ones that I came across. So some specific notes for the diaphragm, some signs of injury. Chest pain, dyspnea, respiratory distress, decreased breath sounds. Remember that the diaphragm is what allows you, helps you breathe. It's your major muscle for breathing. So if there are respiratory problems, you may suspect a diaphragmatic injury. So uh, other things that you can see are abdominal pain and tenderness. That's just because of where the diaphragm sits. You should have an increased index of suspicion in patients with an upper abdominal injury. So just go by your anatomy. If the patient has a stab wound in its left upper quadrant, you're concerned of diaphragmatic injury. If they were shot and if it's left upper quadrant or you have uh, a, if you have a, let's say, uh, an exit wound that's in the thorax on the left side, you're considered of diaphragmatic injury. So 
increase index of suspicion for patients with upper abdominal injury. Another thing where you'd be uh, concerned of uh, diaphragmatic injury is if you flat out see uh, uh, signs on your, uh, on your chest x-ray. So if you see uh, air below the diaphragm, that may be a sign of diaphragmatic injury as well. Uh, the left hemidiaphragm is more frequently injured. Why? Because you have the liver uh, insulating your right diaphragm. So look at the chest x-ray, which in 50% of patients will show abdominal viscera in the hemithorax, elevated hemidiaphragm, other abnormal signs. This will necessitate laparotomy or laparoscopy for repair. And a delayed diagnosis is associated with hernia strangulation, and increased morbidity and mortality. The problem with diaphragmatic injury is, depending on how bad it is, some patients are not diagnosed with diaphragmatic injury because there's nothing that points to it, either on imaging or symptom-wise. And so if they wind up not getting a laparotomy or they do get laparotomy and the surgeon misses it, they can uh, wind up with delayed uh, signs. And that would be things like hernia. So the liver, in general, penetrating trauma involving the liver will get an exploratory laparotomy. Blunt trauma involving the liver can be managed with observation if all of these are true. If the patient is hemodynamically stable and there's no peritoneal signs and there's no injuries requiring laparoscopy and there's no need for excessive transfusions. Really, this just goes with our indications for uh, laparotomy. So if the patient was hemodynamically unstable, they're going to be sent off for laparotomy. Uh, if the patient has peritoneal signs, they're going to be sent off for laparotomy. If the patient has injuries requiring laparotomy or laparoscopy, they're going to be sent off for laparotomy. So you kind of get the picture here. Uh, so some patients with blunt trauma to the liver can be managed with observation. However, they should be managed with observation in the hospital, in preferably a surgical ICU setting, and they need to get a repeat CT after two to three days. Technically, however, uh, operative management is required for a, an AAST, that's the American Association for Surgery of Trauma, a liver injury grade three or higher. And I didn't want to complicate things by giving all of the uh, criteria for how you grade liver injuries or splenic injuries, uh, but that's the that's what trauma surgeons will probably use if they decide they need to do a, uh, if they want to do surgery on a patient with uh, blunt liver injury. Uh, this The AAST uh, indications are primarily focused on the, uh, the length of the laceration and the size of the hematoma, if there is one. As far as the spleen, remember that this is the number one most injured organ in blunt abdominal injury. Uh, you should also suspect this if there are injuries to the thorax. So if there's seventh, eighth, ninth, or tenth left rib fractures, that can penetrate the spleen and cause bleeding. 30% of splenic injury patients will present with hypotensive shock either in the field or as they're wheeled into the hospital. Immediate laparotomy is going to be required if there is ongoing hemodynamic instability, if there is an expanding hematoma, if the patient has a coagulopathy, or if there is an AAST spleen injury grade 3 or greater, which just means a hematoma greater than 50%, or a surface area, uh, or sorry, or a laceration greater than 3 centimeters. So don't commit this stuff to memory, the AAST stuff. I don't think the USMLE is going to require you to remember that. Uh, but as far as the spleen, if there's ongoing hemodynamic instability, expanding hematoma, or the patient has coagulopathy, you'll do a laparotomy uh, to assess the damage. Now, I say assess the damage because it is now recommended that, if possible, you don't remove the entire spleen. It used to be that if you had splenic injury, we would just take the spleen out. That's not preferred now. It's preferred now to remove the damaged portions and leave as much of the spleen in as possible. However, if you do need to remove the, the entire spleen, please remember uh, for board questions that the patient will subsequently need vaccinations against encapsulated bacteria. 
pneumococcus, meningococcus, and uh, Haemophilus influenza type B. If the patient is managed non-operatively, so they fulfilled those criteria, uh, or they didn't fulfill any of these criteria for uh, immediate laparotomy, and they're uh, stable, you should admit them, and they should be on strict bed rest for two to three days. You're going to have this patient prepared as if they need surgery. So they're going to be NPO. You'll want NGD compression. Uh, so they're all ready for surgery in case they need it, in case they go unstable. You'll also want to get serial hematocrits to uh, see if the bleeding is stopped. That's a good indicator uh, to see if uh, bleeding is stopped. And then at three days, you'll get a follow-up CT. And at this point, uh, they can resume light activity. They can go off bed rest, and they can also resume their diet. Because at three days, if they're still stable, at this point, it's highly unlikely that they're going to need surgery. However, for the next three months, they should be on light activity because the spleen is still somewhat fragile. So this is the non-operative approach for splenic injury, but it can only be undertaken in stable patients who don't require laparotomy. If they are in this category, ongoing hemodynamic instability, expanding hematoma, or they have a coagulopathy, and within that category of coagulopathy, I would probably include patients who are on blood thinners. They should have an immediate laparotomy to remove as much of the spleen as needed. And then some other organs. So with the stomach, uh, if you place an NG tube, and in many cases you will, uh, as part of your initial management, if you get a bloody aspirate from the NG tube, that suggests damage to the stomach. Other things that can suggest damage to the stomach to the stomach are subdiaphragmatic free air on chest x-ray, as well as free abdominal fluid on CT. These patients should get antibiotics to cover gut flora, and then you should have repair. And these are prophylactic antibiotics for the most part. Um, again, I would just use either cefoxetin or clindamycin gentamicin. Uh, bowel injury will uh, show up on the CT as a hollow, vis hollow viscous injury. Uh, again, here you'll have some diaphragmatic free air on chest x-ray because you have air within your bowel. You'll also see free abdominal fluid on CT, and then you'll give the patient antibiotics to cover the gut flora and repair. Injuries to the pancreas due to trauma are rare, um, and they're very difficult to diagnose. Typically, the way these present, especially in a vignette, are patients who come back several weeks to months later with feelings of fullness in their stomach. And when you look at them with ultrasound or CT, you see a pseudocyst of the pancreas. And that is managed as itself. That's not a trauma topic. Uh, but uh, this is something to consider, though, uh, when you're thinking of, of, of the pancreas. This is a patient that may not come in due to trauma, probably won't come in due to trauma, but they'll have a history of trauma in many cases. It may not even be severe trauma. It may not even be trauma where they went and got checked for anything. They may have gotten punched in the gut, um, didn't go to the hospital, but then several weeks later, they develop this fullness in, 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 in the stomach area. And so, just as a side, uh, when you're thinking of possible pancreatic pseudocyst, one of the things you've got to ask the patient is, have you had any history of trauma? Have you had anything, have you had any blow to your stomach? Anybody hit you? Got into any kind of car accident or anything? And, of course, if that's positive, then uh, you're concerned for a pancreatic pseudocyst. And with that, that's it for trauma to the abdomen.